What's up? I'm Derek, the PropTech Scout, and if you're an early stage PropTech startup founder, you need to watch this video because I'm going to explain exactly what landlords and developers like myself want as your customer while keeping in mind your priorities as a startup. And ultimately, that is your biggest challenge as a PropTech founder. The timeline and goals of a startup and its investors are inherently at odds with those of your customer. VCs want you to find product market fit as fast as possible, which means you're going to need a bunch of guinea pigs to experiment on. That's perfectly okay when you have a high volume of quick transactions. I call these industries more viscous, because disrupting industries that are receptive to new technology is like diverting the flow of water in a river. Whereas real estate has low viscosity, it's like trying to divert the flow of asphalt, which, if you're not aware, is actually a liquid. Go Google the pitch drop experiment. There's a live stream of asphalt dripping at approximately the rate of one drop every 10 years. Fascinating stuff. But I digress. My point is that real estate owners can't afford to experiment when our buildings have a over a hundred year life cycle. So for founders, finding initial customers can be a real challenge. And once you've iterated a bunch of times and found a good product market fit, your investors want you to grow on steroids. Your pricing and product will evolve and your new customer agreements will look nothing like what you signed with your guinea pigs who will probably leave you. So you're going to have a lot of customer churn before you feel somewhat stable. So founders, if any of this resonated with you, here's a step-by-step -step instruction manual on what you can do better for your customers and win more business. First, if you haven't technically started yet, you need to take a long, hard look at your business model and ask yourself if it's really prop tech. There's a pretty loose definition, but dressing it up as a high-flying tech company can help you raise money faster and attract top talent. But if it's just a plain old real estate business, attaching the prop tech label comes with a lot of baggage. If you want to take VC money, it comes with pretty intense expectations. And prop tech has a stigma attached to it for a lot of real estate insiders. So don't take this decision lightly. It could backfire on you. Next, and especially if you're still conceptualizing your business, you have to think like a real estate developer or landlord. This sounds obvious, but it's not easy. It's a totally different profession from a software engineer, and our capital sources think very differently than a VC. Real estate developers are constantly thinking about schedule and budget. Time is money, promotes by boats. While we have a high tolerance for risk and get high returns, everyone else on our cap stack has a lower risk return profile. The more money a stakeholder has in our deals, the lower risk they want to see, and they all get paid out before we do. So if your product f***s around with the risk profile of the deal, you're not going to find a lot of customers. But if your product improves the risk return profile, the PropTech Scout's going to give you a phone call and ask to try your product. Furthermore, the amount of risk you're taking on doesn't matter to us at all. We don't care that you left your job and are bootstrapping and living off of ramen to change the industry. Your investors know their investment can go to zero. Our lenders and investors expect that in the worst case, they're going to be able to liquidate the property and get a lot of their money back. And they don't want to jeopardize their returns on your experiment just because you're on some self-imposed mission to change the world that makes you feel more important. Sorry, that was me. Moving on to landlords. They think differently than real estate developers. Sometimes we're both but we think differently in different phases of the building life cycle. Once a building is completed and running, we're relentlessly focused on maximizing NOI, so either raising rents or minimizing expenses. There's a lot of different ways to do that. We can make the tenant experience better, make upgrades once in a while, make sure security is tight, and also try to be more efficient at maintenance and prevent big problems by replacing systems on a schedule. And in general, just minimizing vacancy. Every dollar of NOI translates into building value, which upon exit is where we make the bulk of our profit. So back to you founders. If your product is focused on the property management portion of a building's life cycle, you need to focus on improving three key areas, NOI, tenant experience, and the property manager's efficiency. If you go in the opposite direction on any of these, even if you drastically improve the other two, we will not be interested in your product. Plain and simple. Think about it. If you improve our NOI and tenant experience, but not the property manager's efficiency, why would the property manager want more work? Or if you improve NOI and the property manager's efficiency, but you make the tenant's experience worse, why would we want to lose tenants? Or if you improve the tenant experience and the property manager's efficiency, but our NOI goes down, why would we want to lose money? You may not think your product could possibly be hurting your customer, but sometimes we just don't want to use your app for an insignificant portion of our management duties. And sometimes your investors will pressure you to raise prices to the point where our NOI takes a hit. I know this stuff happens because it's happened to me. Okay, next, let me give you some tips on what will help get your early customers. Typically in real estate, your early customers aren't getting the privilege to use your product. You're lucky to land customers. 
I've never seen a prop tech product that real estate developers are clamoring to get on a waitlist for because there's a well-established way to do business that financial stakeholders expect to see. And messing with the status quo messes with a risk profile. If you're asking your customers to take a risk with you by doing things differently and committing to a product from a company that probably won't outlast the building, you have to ask yourself, is your product so much better than the incumbent that the associated risk is justified? Or is it only marginally better but high risk? That's what we think about as your early customer. In order to make up for that kind of risk, you're gonna have to be more like a consultant to us in the early days. That means you'll have to do a lot of things that don't scale, which if you hang around a lot of Silicon Valley types long enough, I'm sure you've heard that a thousand times. Keep your early customers happy. This is when you can establish some of your most loyal customers and followers who can in turn become some of your best spokespeople. But you're not just slaving away for us. It's a symbiotic relationship. Constantly ask us for feedback and we'll help inform you of how your product fits into our processes. When you've reached a point in your growth where you've learned enough from us and it doesn't make sense to give us that one-on-one -on -one attention anymore, there comes a time when you may think about ditching your early adopters to chase high value clients. Because your investors will be pushing you to do that once they see a clear path. I've been ditched before and it's just business, so no hard feelings. But if you don't do it tactfully, I'm not coming back as a customer. The tactful way to do it is to set expectations early on. Beta test customers are getting the benefits of your efforts that don't scale. And not all people in real estate understand that. And some of the more shrewd ones totally understand it and they're simply taking advantage of you. So you should clearly set conditions under which the early stage pricing and level of attention will end, allowing both parties to establish when a conversation should take place in order to continue working together. This is especially tricky if your business model has some sort of recurring revenue from the customer and you change your pricing and service level. If you've nurtured dependency and then raised prices to a point where you're hurting NOI and therefore property value, you're in for a real ugly breakup and possibly some bad press. So while your VC board members are hovering over you and demanding that you price gouge the customers that you've acquired, your challenge is to balance those demands against a good long-term relationship with those customers. Beyond these generalizations, I could go on for hours about what developers and landlords want for each subsector of real estate. And I'm also going to eventually provide a cheat sheet on which subsectors are susceptible to technology disruption. But if I kept going, this video would be way too long and nobody would watch it. So I'll be covering that over time on the blog and sometimes adding extra content on there that I won't turn into videos. So go check it out. Till next time, Prop Tech Scout out. Is that a better catchphrase? I'm working on it.